One of the very first sail-powered vessels came from an operational shortcomings of drifters. Drifters are low-cost untethered buoys that float across the sea surface gathering useful environmental data such as wind, air pressure, temperature, current. The fundamental drawback of the drifting devices, however, is that they drift away from the zone of interest. The designers decide to make it more controllable by incorporating steering facilities. A key to any unmanned vehicle is high reliability, and this means having as few moving parts as possible. Well, this one only has two. The first is the sail. It can swing freely, but sheets or ropes effectively limit the movement of the boom to 45 degrees each side. Setting the sail is controlled by the other moving part, the motorised rudder. The rudder, controlled by navigational software, positions the vessel to tack when against the wind and sail rapidly when the wind's in other quarters. Its small size gives the vessel the advantage of presenting a low profile, which typically allows the boat to withstand greater storms than a large one. Maybe this design that spearheaded the genre was the first vessel driven by underwater sails. Wave energy is greatest at the water surface, decreasing, decreasing rapidly with increasing depth. So uh, this unique two parts architecture exploits a difference in energy to provide forward propulsion. At the surface is the mainstream flotation hull and this houses the payload. Below the surface is a sub attached by an umbilical cord. So the sub captures the wave motion and transfers it into forward motion. As the float moves up and down, wings on the sub rise and fall, each movement propelling the vehicle forward. A solar powered electric thruster is available for extra speed when needed. Now, not only can this reach speeds of three knots, but it actually tow sensor payloads. Another system uses wavefoil technology. With the aid of four keel mounted foils located fore and aft, the wave movements propel the vessel forward at speeds of one to three knots. The whole form itself is designed to withstand heavy seas and deep ocean operations, but the design has a shallow draft so it can be both easily transported and deployed from a beach using only two people. Normally, oil rigs and platforms have a zone of exclusion around them to prevent vessels colliding. These USVs are so small, however, that operators feel more comfortable with them being a lot closer to the structure than they probably would have done. So. They can take uh, measurements within the footprint of, of the rig. We learned that larger motorised vessels can deploy AUVs and ROVs, but non-motorised vessels can also deploy vehicles. Underwater gliders are really useful and a well-established tool for sampling water column. They're easy and cheap to pilot and have an endurance of many months. The buoyancy-driven vehicle works by diving in a steep curve to a given depth and then returning to the surface, carrying out profile measurements en route as required. Vertical and horizontal speeds are typically 10 to 30 centimetres a second, and this gives around, makes it about two days to move 50 kilometres forward. Scientists, however, often want to deploy gliders to capture a specific event, but getting them there under their own power could take in many weeks, and in doing so, consume considerable battery life. Gliders are also difficult to launch and recover in shallow water or inshore areas. Alternatively, they may want to get the glider to a specific, specific location at a given time, such as to track a spring bloom or a volcanic eruption or a hurricane arriving. And that's why gliders are often taken to location by boats before deployment, and this can be expensive. The University of East Anglia recently mounted a glider under its Caravella USV and delivered it to a specific location considerably faster than the glider could get there by itself. The glider launch was then triggered remotely using a satellite signal. So let's say the USV is used to measure things like atmospheric temperature, air pressure, humidity, wind velocity, long wave and short wave downwelling radiation, sea surface temperature, salinity, and near surface currents. Well, working in collaboration with the glider, it's possible to obtain simultaneous meteorological and ocean oceanographic um, measurements. An advantage of USVs 
is that being unmanned, they can be used in very severe conditions. Last year, one circumnavigated the Antarctic in a 196-day journey, sailing over 22,000 kilometres before returning to port. During the mission, it survived freezing temperatures, 15-metre waves, 130 kilometres per hour, 80, 80 mile an hour winds, and collisions with icebergs. The design consists of a tall, hard wing incorporating a longitudinal spar with a vertical tail. A trim tab on the tail adjusts the wing angle to the wind. The sail sits on a narrow 7 metre long hull and a keel with a 2.5 metre draft. It weighs approximately 750 kilograms and is normally launched when recovered from a dock. These vehicles can travel at an average speed of 2 to 3 knots, but they can actually reach top speeds of 8 knots. When they first tried it, okay, it could withstand the 80 knot winds, but it was the enormous Southern Ocean waves that were too much for it. Attempts to circumnavigate the Southern Ocean were made in 2015 and 2017. Each time the swing failed. In the end, the designers dis developed a lower aspect square rig to deal with the huge forces and being rolled and submerged by 15 meter breaking waves. One of the coolest designs is a vehicle consisting of a rigid wing sail positioned over a submerged single or catamaran hull, which creates a counterbalance to ensure the sail always remains upright. This arrangement not only reduces wave drag, but gives it a low visual impact with little or no wake. It also has a very low acoustic impact. A passive mechanical wing sail control me mechanism automatically sets the sail at an optimum position for any given wind direction without using pulleys, cables or electronics. This lack of complexity not only increases reliability but also significantly reduces cost. A servo to control the rudder is the only electromechanical com component needed to sail autonomously. The hotel load to run the entire platform is less than a watt. All light sail vessels have the potential to be damaged in storm waves. The vehicle designers therefore decided to obviate this problem by giving the vessel the capacity to submerge to 10 metres depth. Solar panels are installed inside the transparent rigid wing sail and these provide the onboard power for the navigation and sensor electronics. In the past year, the company's also developed a mini version, two thirds the size and half the weight of the larger version, which means it's small enough to be transported on an aeroplane. Apart from having an even smaller profile, it introduces the possibility of the devices being used in a swarm. Now here's another one, but this time it's got a rigid wing sail, and this can fold down on demand to transform into a fully autonomous underwater vehicle capable of submerging to 200 metre depths. Precise underwater navigation is achieved using inertial navigation system, INS, coupled with Doppler Velocity Log, DVL, and its propulsion comes from a dual electric thrusters. If you want to know more about subsea engineering, read UT2 or UT3, the magazine and online magazine of the Society for Underwater Technology.